We'll get started. Uh, Paul Cameron speaking here. Dr. Slezarev uh, is also hosting, but he may, may, may be in and out. Um, just a few information pieces. Uh, we've started, uh, this is the first of hopefully many uh, information sessions just directed around COVID in our ICUs, and we'll hopefully be sharing clinical information as well as practical stuff. Um, we are going to record the, uh, the presentation component of this, Dr. Payne's part, and then with the intention of posting this so it's available for people who can't make this, but the question and answer session that will follow afterwards will not be posted. So if anybody, uh, please, uh, we would understand. And then if everybody who's uh, joining in could just mute their microphone, we can just have Dr. Payne, uh, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, so with that, I'll just introduce Dr. Payne. He comes to us from IPAC. We asked him, along with uh, Bev Lewis, uh, Murat and myself asked him to come and to share some information related to COVID and IPAC uh, at our ICU. So Dr. Payne, if you want to go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll un unmute myself here. So this is the new normal of presenting uh, with these Zoom webinars. There's a very uh, a nice um, medicine uh, for last weekend by Meg Devlin, which I think went uh, pretty well. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, so today I'm going to focus on uh, IPAC updates, mostly a little bit of background about uh, COVID-19 uh, and then with an IPAC update related to uh, critical care. Um, so one thing I noticed today uh, as an update is I saw these signs on in the elevators, which I maybe haven't noticed uh, before, but these are actually from the Middlesex London Health Unit. So I, I looked at the person in the elevator next to me and I said, I, I don't know if this six feet, maybe if we stand diagonal across one another, just not like straight across, we might be able to be protected from one another. But uh, I don't think they really agreed with me, but uh, at least good messaging from public health. Um, so uh, objectives, so I'm going to review the current epidemiology of COVID-19, um, describe the recommended infection control precautions for COVID-19 and critical care. Um, since I'm from the lab as well, I was going to just outline, give a testing update as part of this, um, and then review the de-escalation of precautions for COVID-19, which we've had a lot of questions about as well. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is the actual, I follow ProMed, which is kind of an online um, uh, forum for reports of infectious diseases or outbreaks across the world. And so this is the first report that I received after finishing being on call over the uh, Christmas and New Year's. And so I got this uh, outbreak here and I remember actually having coffee with a colleague of mine. I said, I, you know, it's in a Wu something, a W name. Apparently it has like 11 million people, but I've never heard of it. Um, and so, yes, there was a time when people didn't know where, where Wuhan was uh, in the world. And I was one of those people. Um, but of course, we all know that information now. Um, and then I have an even a very damaging communication that I sent out to my colleagues as well. Um, so this was on just for retrospective about I, I thought I was thinking this the other day. So on January 10th, this is as much as I thought of COVID-19. At this point, it doesn't seem to be readily transmitted from human to human. There's been no transmission of healthcare workers. There have been no mortalities tied to it. However, I did concede that some of these patients didn't need critical care. So that's what we knew on um, January 10th. And I'm sure probably some of you are, are laughing at some of those statements, but at that time, that's what we thought. We didn't know if it was even transmitted from person to person. So obviously um, a whole lot has changed. And if we're looking at it um, over the span of kind of three to four months. Um, so obviously, um, I think we all know this, I won't belabor too much, but um, it emerged in late December in China, maybe it had actually emerged in November. Um, it was linked to um, a wholesale uh, market, um, which was labeled the seafood market, but they have many different types of animals. Um, and it was uh, renamed as SARS-CoV-2, um, and it kind of resembled uh, SARS-CoV-1, which was the first virus. And so this is just kind of the epidemic curve in China where it first started out. I, you probably can't see the points here, but obviously related to um, the seafood market, then having a lot of transmission from that point, um, and then uh, ultimately controlled in China. Um, this is a picture of the market here. Um, and this is one that I always like to share that history does kind of rhyme. Um, so a lot of people um, don't realize that after SARS-1 um, that uh, occurred in uh, southeastern China, they actually did shut down all the wild animal markets for a year. Um, but it is a very deeply rooted uh, cultural practice in China. And so they were actually reopened um, after that time. And of course, this market was linked to that selling many different wild animals. Um, and China imposed a ban on these wild food markets. Will they open, be opened up a year again after this? I don't know. 
but it is kind of interesting there that history does sometimes repeat itself. Um, this is just a microbiology plug here that uh, um, we have here. You can see on the bottom right here, this is actually the cultured virus. So when we grow virus on cell culture lines, it damages the cell lines that it grows in and causes a cytopathic effect. So that defect in that bottom right is the cytopathic defect from the, the um, cultured coronavirus. Um, and that's when it was first isolated and then very quickly sequenced. So as opposed to when we first had SARS, um, SARS-CoV initially back in 2002, it took many months to actually get the full sequence of the virus. Of course, this was completed within a week, one or two weeks time. Um, this is the picture of the virus here. You can see kind of those spike projections. It gives it a crown-like appearance or the corona around the sun, and that's where it gets its name from um, on there. So it's in the... Um, uh, the, the beta family, as far as these ones of coronaviruses, so there's um, SARS-CoV was the initial one, and this is, uh, at the time, it's called novel coronavirus, but it's in the same kind of branch as SARS-CoV-1, this is SARS-CoV-2, and closely related to the bat viruses, um, other bat um, SARS viruses, um, less closely related to MERS-CoV, um, and less closely related to the seasonal coronaviruses that are listed here, such as HKU or OC43, uh, which are the ones that we see every year. Um, so on February 11th, um, they officially named it as COVID-19. Uh, so it's amazing that actually for a period of time, it wasn't called COVID, it was called novel coronavirus. Now COVID is such a common term, um, but at one time that was a big shift when we did start uh, declaring um, that. Uh, uh, naming it at that, and then public health declared a public health emergency uh, at the end of January. Um, so coronaviruses are enveloped RNA viruses. They can infect uh, mammals, birds, and humans. Um, prior to SARS-CoV-2, there were six main ones. There's four other species um, that we see every year here. So that's 229E, OC43, and NL63 uh, and HKU1. And so these are the ones that we actually test for here in our, our respiratory Mainly, it's just for patients with cystic fibrosis or for some of our very sick transplants or younger kids that we actually test for it because most of the time um, it actually causes just a, a mild upper respiratory tract infection. And obviously, um, this is an exception. So, the exceptions of the two previous ones, such as SARS CoV 1, which was previously just called SARS, um, that emerged in 2002, and then if you see Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome that emerged in 2012. Um, and so uh, one was in China, then uh, caused uh, SARS-CoV, caused that larger outbreak in Toronto. It wasn't large, but did cause, um, did have healthcare transmission at that point. And then MERS-CoV, um, which has caused an outbreak in the Middle East, which has subsided uh, substantially since the initial outbreak in 2012, but there's still some lingering cases there. Um, so as far as coronaviruses, bats tend to by them. Uh, quite frequently. Um, and then for MERS-CoV, they think that it goes from bats to camels uh, and then to humans. And humans tend to be a bit of a dead-end host. So once it gets a human gets infected with MERS-CoV, there sometimes is some uh, transmission between in the hospital setting or amongst close family members, but there's no sustained transmission. And so um, that's the reason why MERS-CoV really hasn't spread since um, its initial introduction back in 2012. We haven't seen much more of it. Um, this is the palm civet, which is a uh, cat-like creature uh, in southeast China, and that's the one that got infected from bats and ca caused the initial SARS outbreak. Um, again, SARS, um, the outbreak was arrested mostly because I, I think is, uh, what's unique about SARS is that the highest viral loads tended to occur about a week or two in the illness and was associated with patients who were critically ill. So um, usually by the time someone was having their highest viral loads, they were already in hospital and isolated. And so I think that's the reason why it was an easier disease to contain. Um, so people have theorized that maybe snakes had spread this one or a pangolin, um, which is kind of an odd armadillo shaped uh, or um, mammal. But I don't think anyone has said for sure what is the intermediate host, but we do know that it is a bat-like coronavirus for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, these are the comparisons between the diseases here that we see. So most related to critical care, this data is a little bit out of date, but I think the numbers still kind of hold true. Um, that with SARS-CoV, there was about a 10% mortality rate and about 20% of people need to be vented. 
With MERS-CoV, it's actually more pathogenic, and so 80% of people um, need ventilatory support and 40% mortality rate. With um, SARS-CoV-2, um, the mortality rate ranges from different centers anywhere from one to maybe three and a half percent. And uh, some centers, for some reason, tend to have higher mortality rates. Like Italy has reported a higher mortality rate. People aren't really sure why. It's theorized to maybe be their elderly population or poor early control of the outbreak. No one knows for sure. Um, but the true mortality rate probably lies somewhere between one and two percent. Um, Ventilator support, this was near the beginning of the outbreak where they said it potentially was nine to eight percent, sorry, uh, nine to eight percent. I think that that probably that number now is that uh, if you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, 80 percent of people will have a mild illness, 20 percent of people have an illness requiring hospitalization, usually related to hypoxemia, and then about five percent of people actually need admission to the ICU. Um, so it is a much smaller proportion who needs a mission to your unit than with other diseases, um, those ones here. And then to compare it to the mortality rate for seasonal influenza, it, it's about 0.2%. And then the large epidemic of Spanish flu in 1918 resulted in 2% mortality, which is um, probably the, the the biggest um, uh, pandemic before this one as well. Obviously, the Spanish mortality killed 20 million people. So many more uh, mortalities associated with the Spanish flu. People think that it may have been associated that that was the end of World War One, and there was large populations of malnu- uh, malnourished peoples. And so they feel that um, that's the reason why there was such a high mortality rate. And it was mostly in younger people who were in close camps and military camps, et cetera. So, Um, The Spanish flu did have a mortality rate relatively um, close to SARS-CoV-2, but a different population where the mortality rate, uh, sorry, the mortality for SARS-CoV-2 seems mainly related to elderly patients or those with other comorbidities such as cardiac or lung disease underlying. Um, This is another um, interesting thing about SARS-CoV-2. So um, as you guys are well aware, a lot of times what happens here is that um, you have an onset of symptoms here at day zero. And uh, a lot of times patients will actually have mild symptoms for a few days and then they come in the hospital, maybe with some shortness of breath, and then they decompensate quickly. From speaking with a lot of the, some of the intensivists, they find that maybe day three or day four is where they see a lot of this decompensation. Obviously, you guys are the experts on it, um, but that's after admission to hospital. So obviously, they probably had symptoms for a few days, get them in the hospital, and then if they are going to deteriorate, it happens usually within the first few days that they're up on the wards right now. So right now on the wards, um, our main cohort units are um, the fourth floor of the medicine ward at University Hospital, so U4300, or D5200, which is the respirology unit at Victoria Hospital. And so patients will typically get admitted there if they're not critically ill at the time of presentation hospital, and then if they did come, they'd be transferred down to you guys. Um, so as far as the incubation period goes, um, it typically is about five days. Um, we do say up to 14 days, two to 14 days is the main range, but I think further data is even showing that it may be shorter than that, or typically four to seven days. Uh, so if you get past seven days, it's very unlikely that you're going to go on to develop symptoms. Uh, but there is a trailing endpoint in some late presentations. Um, as far as transmission goes, that I think uh, this R naught number, which no one knew about, but has now been highly publicized over the last three months. Now everyone knows what R naught number is. Um, typically, seasonal influenza is about 1.3, so one person infects 1.3 other people. Um, coronavirus does tend to um, infect uh, slightly more people, so about 2.2 people. Um, which is um, relatively close to the original SARS as well. Um, and, and the comparison to the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918, it's, um, it's two as well. So one person infects 2.2 people. So obviously we've seen massive transmission across the globe. Um, this was very interesting. I was uh, updating my talk from, uh, for this. I gave a, a talk to the family medicine group. And so I was going through my slides and it was a few weeks ago. And at that point it was under 100,000 cases worldwide. And even over the, the course of a few weeks now we're over uh, 1.3 million cases. The epicenter of the epidemic is actually moved. It's not East Asia anymore at all in any way. The epicenter of the epidemic is probably the eastern seaboard of the U.S. as well as Europe, uh, particularly uh, the southern Mediterranean, uh, as well as uh, the U.K., where we've seen a lot of cases and in Germany. So um, 
so things have been pr progressed very rapidly as far as that goes. Um, so COVID in Canada. So um, on January 25th, the first case was identified in Toronto, and we actually had one of the first cases in Canada here in London. Um, it was a traveler from Wuhan, um, and uh, they were managed appropriately and recovered. Um, this is the, the cases here in Canada. I, I just saw an update today about the number of new cases. Um, the epi does seem to show that central Canada seems to have an increasing rise of cases. Um, BC, which was one of the hotbeds earlier on, has kind of flattened the curve, as they say. Um, but uh, we're still seeing increasing case numbers, and I, I don't think we've hit peak yet. I, I still think that we'll probably hit peak cases in the middle to, to late April, uh, depending on how well kind of our social distancing and isolation um, strategies work. Um, so with regards to uh, COVID and IPAC, um, so these are just the different ways that a disease can be transmitted. So obviously there's contact, which is either direct contact or through fomites, which is uh, an object that, um, that can be touched and transfer it. Um, then there's droplet transmission, which are these heavy droplets that fall out of the air. Um, and usually those um, occur within two meters or six feet because they weigh so much that they just fall straight to the ground. Um, and then you have airborne particles or airborne transmission that can go past two meters. Um, I do want to stress that a lot of people have said that there has been airborne transmission of, of um, COVID. I would say that um, COVID is still, the best literature still shows that this is a droplet and contact transmitted disease. Yes, when there's an aerosol generating procedure that you can have aerosolization of some of the droplets, but that's different from a true airborne disease that something like measles um, or chicken pox that are much, much more infectious. Um, and as far as vehicle transmission, things like blood, we get a lot of questions about this of whether, um, whether it can be transmitted by blood transfusions and that um, so far there's no evidence of this. Um, the best evidence is that in a very small proportion of patients, they can detect the RNA or the genetic copies in the blood. But no one, as far as I'm aware, has been able to actually culture live virus from the blood. And Canada Blood Services does not screen currently, at least in my last update, uh, for risk of uh, transmission of COVID-19 by blood transfusions. Um, as well as for vector-borne transmission, there's been, I know in the popular media, there's been questions about when we get to black fly uh, or mosquito uh, season, will there be transmission? And there's no evidence at all to suggest it'll be transmitted by um, uh, insects. Um, and so again, it's just to say that COVID-19 is, is routinely transmitted through droplets and fomites during close contact. Um, airborne uh, spread has not been reported for COVID-19. Yes, they're um, during an aerosol generating procedure, um, especially for the people who are within two meters because there being micro aerosolization of these droplets um, to wear an N95 mask, um, which is uh, being done in the CCTC and the MSICU. And, um, the other thing I would say is that we also get a lot of questions about fecal shedding. And so it is true that they have de detected some of the genetic material, this virus, in the GI tract. Um, however, the same studies where they look to try to culture the virus, it doesn't seem to be that there's an infected virus in the GI tract. I don't think it's really a major contributor to transmission. I think that the, the focus of transmission for COVID-19 is secretions from the respiratory tract. Um, so what's important, um, so it's for IPAC, it's routine practices that we do every day. So it's important to wash your hands, do a risk assessment, to see if you're at risk of getting splashed um, with droplets or secretion. Um, we also, uh, for patients who are undergoing an um, uh, aerosol generating medical procedure, we do environmental control. So things like negative pressure rooms for people who are undergoing AGMP, such as intubation. We also have administrative controls, which basically means that we have a system in place to flag these patients. Um, so when a patient presents to a MERS department, they ask if they have, if they have symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, and then uh, if they are, then they're placed on isolation. So that's what it means by administrative controls. And then our last line of defense for any um, type of transmission is our personal protective equipment. And so um, about a week ago, we did move to universal masking for all um, staff here who are seeing patients. And so that means that um, regardless if someone's symptomatic or not, you are wearing a surgical mask uh, for these patients. Um, so yeah, so just following up additional precautions. So universal masking, 
Um, if you're seeing a patient who has COVID-19, obviously in your critical care unit, you're typically using the droplet and contact uh, plus enhanced PPE um, if they're undergoing AGMP. Um, and then otherwise, it's droplet precautions only. That's particularly important for your extubated patients. And that, those are the precautions that are being used on our hospital wards as well, so upstairs on uh, U4 or D5. Um, we also have uh, an intubation protocol that um, I worked on with, with some of the intensivists as well um, to, to give an extra layer of protection for those higher risk procedures, particularly intubation and bronchoscopy. Um, so these are the droplet contact enhanced um, signs, which we had but didn't typically use before this outbreak. We put them up for the odd case of potentially a MERS-CoV case, someone who traveled to Saudi Arabia and back. But uh, we printed a lot more of these signs since then, and we've been using them. And these are the ones that you may see up on the patient room. So what's the difference here is it's um, typically they recommend a full face shield instead of just goggles, and then an N95 respirator in addition to um, uh, just the surgical mask, and then obviously gowns and gloves. Um, and then I, I do want to highlight here that it is kind of grouped in these organisms where we use droplet and contact precautions, but again, with uh, aerosol agenting procedures, we do uh, recommend it negative pressure if available in a respirator. Um, but just to say that this is not an airborne disease, it's not TB, it's not measles or chickenpox, which have much higher R0 numbers, particularly for measles and chickenpox. Um, and then if you guys are now having to wear N95 respirators, this is my favorite infographic of infographics. So if anyone here has a soul patch, you're fine. You're going to be okay. But uh, uh, a long stubble, you're going to have to shave off there. Or, um, but you can have a painter's brush if you'd like it. So, or even a Zappa. I didn't even know a Zappa name on there before. So anyway, but check your facial hair, see if it conforms for a respirator. Um, this is a question that we get a lot about is um, a list of aerosol generating medical procedures. So we actually had a large group of IPAC uh, and, and infectious disease physicians across Ontario get together and decide what do we consider an AGMP and what isn't. And so um, equally important of what is an AGMP and what isn't, because we do get a lot of people saying, well, this is, a, this is an AGMP, this is not. So, one question we even get a lot is just giving electroconvulsive therapy, which is still given for depression. People were saying that that could be an AGMP. It's not. Um, cardiac stress test, you know, a vaginal delivery of a baby is not an AGMP. Um, but what is? So this is when you're actually doing instrumentation on the respiratory tract or you're forcing high pressure air through the, the airway. And so our highest, um, AG, highest risk AGMPs would be bronchoscopy and intubation. So that is when you're actually putting in uh, a tube or an instrument down the airway, and so there can be aerosolization with that. Um, those are the ones that I think really need to be focused on. Uh, a code blue in itself, um, chest compressions, we don't really consider an AGMP on its own, but usually when you progress to chest compression, you may be intubating soon, so it's probably best just to prepare yourself that you're going to be performing an AGMP. Um, as far as um, high flow oxygen therapy, we don't consider things um, such as non-rebreathers masks or venturi or venti masks or even nasal prongs routinely as being AGMP. Those are not. It's not pressurized air going through the tract. And so what we do say is though for some of the ones that are higher flow or pressurized heated humidified air, things like Aerovo, which some of the patients are being um, uh, maintained on, or OptiFlow, those are ones that we would consider an AGMP. Now, I would consider those ones um, such as um, CPAP or BiPAP and Aerovo being a much lower risk AGMP is com compared to intubation. And I actually know that some centers have, have, have not considered ergo and AGMP. So I think it is, is relatively uh, low risk, but here at LHSC, we do consider an AGMP and make, and make sure that the staff are wearing an N95 during those as well. Um, uh, and then, uh, I wonder if I can go back here, yeah. And then one thing actually, question that comes up a lot is about suctioning. Is, is suctioning an AGMP. And so what I say is kind of the rule of thumb. If your suctioning tube is going below the level of the trachea and it's open, then it is an AGMP. So if you're doing a tracheal aspirate, that's a closed inline system. That is not an AGMP. But if we have patients who are up on the ward who have a, a tracheostomy and then they're going to do an open suction down below the level of trachea, that's what we consider it. Normal oral suctioning is not an AGMP. Okay. Um, so I, I'm going to move to next uh, related to IPAC and, and again, I, 
I want to speak, you know, openly about this is that, uh, and you guys are our frontline workers, is that there is a global, national, and provincial shortage of PPE. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the work that you guys are doing um, with limited supplies, and we're trying to work through this as, as best we can. Um, right now, the N95 respirators are the most critical. Um, across Canada, we're having issues with this. Um, you can even see that things change almost every day such as the U.S. and Canada being engaged in a almost a trade embargo with regards to it, where Trump had said initially that they wouldn't be allowed in the country and then potentially they may be with further negotiations. But this is a rapidly evolving situation. Um, most centers in Ontario, because of these supply issues, have moved to two, two surgical masks a day or one N95 to conserve supplies. Um, we're actively uh, investigating other alternatives um, we do uh, other N95s that we're going to be um, fit testing to, such as another line of them called 8210s, and so we're just trying to get those off the ground, and the ED critical care units and the medicine units that are COVID-19 medicine units are the ones being prioritized to get that fit, fit testing done. So I really do appreciate all the staff support during this, this difficult time, and, and we're trying to work through this the best that we can. Um, so I'm just going to change gears to, to diagnostic testing. Um, so as far as um, diagnostic methods, the virus has been cultured, um, but it's not a very sensitive method. It's really just uh, more of a research um, option. Um, serology is we get a lot of questions about, and it is actually when this first disease first emerged um, in uh, January and February, there wasn't any serology, but there actually are some commercial manufacturers making kits, and LHC is, a, is actually evaluating one of these commercial kits right now, so it measures IgG and IgA. Um, it's good for detecting uh, an infection response after 10 days, um, so it's not good to, it's not very reliable to detect an acute infection, but once someone's more than 10 days past infection, it is, um, it is uh, a relatively sensitive way uh, to determine if you've been infected. Um, the workhorse of diagnostics is still molecular testing, or PCR, um, uh, that we're performing here. Um, so one thing I wanted to highlight is that um, prior um, to January, we did test for coronavirus, but again, this was just part of our um, high-risk populations, and that was just for seasonal coronaviruses, so um, that, was, uh, that would not actually detect uh, the novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, or SARS-CoV-2. Um, but after this occurred, um, we did actually, uh, working with the Public Health Lab in Ontario, develop our own test. So initially, we were sending our testing to the PHL. Uh, and then we have now validated our own test that has been rolled out for a few weeks now, and it's working well. We don't send to the PHL for confirmation anymore, only for um, some unique scenarios where we want to do confirmatory testing. But for the vast majority of reports that you're getting, um, it will be from the LHSC lab. Um, the one exception to that is the assessment center in London, where the majority of testing from the assessment center is sent to the public health lab in London, um, but um, some samples are sent to LHSC. So if you have a patient who had a test done at the assessment center, there's a chance that it may have been performed uh, at the public health lab. Um, so you guys have a unique population here that for most other patients in the hospitals, what we're going to get is a nasopharyngeal swab and viral transport media. Um, we initially had a very um, acute shortage of viral transfer media, but things have gotten better um, since that point. Things are opening up a bit. Um, so most patients submitted to ward will just get a, a nasopharyngeal swab. But since you guys have a large portion of patients who are intubated, it is great if you guys could also send um, a tracheal aspirin um, with those because it is more sensitive of a sample than the nasopharyngeal swab. Um, it's important to remember that we don't want you guys um, it is nice to have a lower respiratory tract specimen, but you shouldn't perform an aerosol generated medical procedure to obtain it. So um, we do not recommend to um, do an induced sputum. If someone has projective cough and can do an expectorated sputum, then by, by all means submit it, but don't induce it. Um, and don't perform a diagnostic bronchoscopy unless it's medically indicated if you're suspecting COVID. If, if you need to do the bronchoscopy med medically, that's fine, but don't perform it just for the sake of diagnosing COVID, a, a tracheal aspirate is acceptable. Um, so this is actually um, our uh, Hamilton extractor. So this is one of the new pieces of equipment. So we started off here testing and we're ramping up uh, capacity. Right now, um, we're at approximately about 100, 150, 200 tests a day and we're testing for the whole region. So 
um, the acute care facilities such as Windsor Regional Hospital, Sarnia, and even some of them up further north. So it isn't just London, uh, London LHSC or St. Joe's that we're testing for. Um, we have getting some higher flow through equipment. So we're hoping at some point over the next couple of weeks uh, to get up to 500 tests a day, which would, which would improve our capacity to test more people, which has been a limiting factor in all of Ontario and LHSC is not an exception to this. So um, I'm hopeful that will roll out soon. Again, there's always pinching points. I think that it's really important to realize that, and I think some of you guys have probably realized this in the words as well, is that the global supply chain has been severely disrupted with the COVID epidemic. And um, even things that we, you know, we may even have capacity for 500, uh, but even sometimes reagents and other components of the testing cycle are limiting, just as you guys are on the wards and you find limiting factors as far as other supplies. So I think it's, it's very frustrating for all of us that sometimes we're limited by our supplies because of the COVID epidemic and there's been higher utilization of those. Um, so who are we testing? Um, so right now we sit down with a regional committee, um, which includes infectious diseases, um, emergency department, a regional partners, um, and as well as administration from the lab. And we sit down and decide, well, we only have so many tests, who should we test? Um, and so basically we say, um, we only gonna test the, the sickest patients. And so um, if you're gonna be admitted to hospital or likely to be admitted, then we will test you. Um, we will test symptomatic people for elective surgeries that can't be postponed for surgeries that have to be done within a week. An example is a cancer surgery and it can't be postponed, we'll do that. We do not perform testing for asymptomatic patients before surgery. Um, and we also test pregnant uh, moms who are about to deliver and who are symptomatic because they're going to be admitted as well. Um, we also test um, some of our high risk um, outpatients such as dialysis, uh, transplant patients and cancer patients. Um, and the, uh, as far as they're not patients, but they're equally important is our staff here at the hospital. Um, because what we want to do is make sure that staff are able to come back as quickly as possible and work. And so if you're symptomatic, if you're having, uh, you know, fever, cough, shortness of breath or sore throat, then call occupational health and then you can get arranged to get tested at the assessment center. Um, so testing frequency and turnaround time. So specimens are processed in our microbiology lab. Right now we're doing four times, four tests a day, seven days a week. Um, and we're now reporting results within 24 hours. And so before um, it was taking sometimes up to four to five days to get a result from public health. So we're very excited that we're now able to give you guys a result within 24 hours. Um, there's some samples that have discrepant or inconclusive or indeterminate results. And then those instances, sometimes we have to do secondary testing and the report can be delayed up to 48 hours. So if you have a sample that you haven't seen a result for within 24 hours, it may be that that sample needed some additional testing. Um, all testing in this stream is kind of deemed critical by the, um, by the hospital. And so you don't need to call to prioritize it. We will, get, we will put it on the next run um, that we receive and get results with you within 24 hours. If there's a special circumstance related to that sample that you want to communicate, communicate to the microbiologist on call, give us a page at 1900, um, sorry, 19,000, and we'll respond to that concern. Um, so how do we test? So it's a gene target called the e-gene or the envelope gene of the virus, and it's the most sensitive target that most sensors are testing for, um, including our public health lab uh, and many of them across the country. And so what we do is we test the sample for this e-gene target that's most sensitive. If it's positive, if it's a good strong positive, we'll call it positive. Um, immediately, and if it's a negative, we'll call the sample negative. No further testing will be done. If we have kind of a, a weak result for it, uh, a weak positive, what we'll say sometimes is that'll be inconclusive, and we'll do another PCR test or another test to see if that will resolve it. If it's also positive, we'll report it as positive, but if we have discrepant results, you may get an inconclusive. So for those patients where you have an inconclusive result, what we do is recommend is to um, if it's clinically indicated to repeat another swab within kind of, you know, 48 hours to see if you want to clarify the status of that patient. Um, and, and so when we do get an indeterminate inconclusive result, it may be just because it's a weak positive or it may be a nonspecific false positive signal. And it's really impossible to tell. Um, typically, when, if you get one of these results, I would absolutely recommend that they stay on on droplet and contact or droplet contact and enhanced precautions until you get additional testing to resolve that situation. Um, and then this is another kind of issue that I know has been getting more um, coverage lately is the testing performance. And so 
Um, I have to say that we're still, I think, early on in understanding of how sensitive a test is, even with all the tests that have been done. I, there still isn't great data on this. However, when you compare PCR testing to things like CT chest, um, serial repeat testing, serology, um, some people have said that data from a, a single upper respiratory tract specimen may only be, have a sensitivity of 70%, particularly if it's taken very early on in the illness. Um, at least from the data I've seen from China, the peak viral shedding uh, from patients tends to be at day three to five of illness, which is actually very different from SARS-CoV-1. The original SARS is that um, most, the peak viral shedding in those groups was at seven to 14 days. So the peak viral shedding in, in COVID seems to be earlier in patients, um, which, is, which is a bit different. Um, and so, um, but I, it is important to remember that lower respiratory tract samples do have improved sensitivity. So things like bronchoscopies may even have a sensitivity of 95%, and the tracheal aspirate would be closer to that than the 70%. And so the nice thing in the CCTC or the MSICU is that since you do have that available, is that we always encourage you to submit uh, lower respiratory tract sample as well with that. Um, this is just some of the data that I would, um, this is from a New England Journal of Medicine paper where you look at shedding. Um, and so for most patients here on the top left is the, um, the nasal swabs. And so you can see here that the high-risk viral loads are again in that kind of three to five day period, and then they drop off, and many patients are negative by 10 days, uh, and certainly most of them by 14 days. And so that's the reason why you may see those um, comments in the public, if you're sick, stay home until 14 days, because there's actually scientific um, evidence behind it that uh, you should be stopping to shed virus by that point. And that's what we recommend for our healthcare workers. If, uh, and for patients who are still admitted to hospital, if we retest them at 10 days and if we get two negative, then they can be cleared um, from being infectious. Um, this is a, a nice study that was published uh, in Nature. And what was interesting here is they compared nasal swabs, um, nasopharyngeal swabs, sorry, to sputum, uh, as well as to GI tract. And so you can see here that the swab data was very similar. Most people cleared by seven days. Um, people tended to have um, prolonged shedding in the sputum a bit longer than other um, than from the nasal swabs. And so if you still have a patient who's intubated um, when you're trying to clear someone, so if someone is, is extubated, then obviously it's a nasopharyngeal swab. But if you're clearing, trying to clear someone who is still intubated in your unit, then what I would say is that it's best to get um, a tracheal aspirate in that situation. Now, I would say that I would want to have them clinically improving before you try to clear them. Like they should be on the road to extubation or there should, there should be some other clear reason why they're still intubated if you're trying to clear them from uh, precautions. But um, one thing I'd like to highlight is that they actually did cultures and there was no positive cultures past eight days. And that's something, this is a new virus, but if we compare it to something like influenza, we know that many patients who are um, critically ill can half the patients will still be positive at seven days past illness, and that trailing endpoint can go over quite some time. But we know that those patients are no longer infectious. And so what happens is that this genetic material can be within the respiratory tract and, set and shed for a prolonged period of time, but they may no longer be infectious. And so I, I have a suspicion that eventually we'll revise some of these guidelines um, to reflect that, you know, probably past, you know, here this very nice trial show, past eight days, there's no live virus. Maybe it'll go to 10 days after that, I'm not sure. Um, but currently we're still sticking with the 14 days after infections for people who are discharged home. But if someone's admitted in our facility, we do want those two negative swabs before clearing them because again, they may expose other patients, healthcare workers, if we haven't documented that they're cleared. As well for healthcare workers, we still like to see two negative swabs because what we wanna do is make sure that they're completely clear um, before they go back and see patients, particularly those who are, um, who are quite ill. Right. Um, so removing precautions, I think I've kind of said this as, as well, is that you want someone to be at a minimum 10 days from symptom onset um, and at least 48 hours of symptom free. And we want two negative PCR swabs uh, 24 hours apart, preferably they're extubated. Um, and for critically ill, critically ill patients, they may shed for longer. And so what I've, I've said to some of the physicians is that I wouldn't start going down the road of someone who's intubated trying to clear them until 14 days after symptom onset. If patients are at home, they're at home, they're not exposing any healthcare workers. What we typically say is 14 days after symptom onset or until symptoms have resolved for 48 hours. Um, 
This is, I think, probably the more challenging issue that you guys are facing right now is what to do. So when you have a positive, that's very clear. Um, but what do you do when you have a negative, particularly with the concerns about the sensitivity of the assay? And so um, if you have someone who's symptomatic and their COVID PCR is negative, so when I say symptomatic, fever, cough, shortness of breath, or other respiratory issues, I would say if they're symptomatic, obviously keep them on precautions. So we use droplet and contact precautions for symptoms. And so even if you have a negative COVID test and someone is still coughing a lot, has obvious respiratory tract infection, keep them on precautions. Um, what we recommend is that you can uh, do repeat testing um, after 48 hours of initial negative if there's a high clinical suspicion of COVID. Um, and so what I would recommend is that case, usually on the admission, you get a nasopharyngeal swab and a tracheal aspirate. Um, if those come back negative, but if you still have a strong clinical suspicion, repeat that test within 48 hours. Um, and, uh, and usually all you need to submit with that one is just a single tracheal aspirate because that's the lower respiratory one that's a bit more sensitive. Uh, that one. And what I would say is that usually we try to have people who have had symptom onset for five days or more before you collect that second test. So if you had someone admitted to your facility who's in the first day or two of symptoms, don't repeat that test until they've had symptoms for at least five days. Just try just so that you can capture uh, the most sensitive test in that period of high viral shedding. Um, and then if you have those either initial negative and a low clinical suspicion or um, someone who had a high suspicion, but you've had two negatives, then we would recommend that you can take people off precautions um, 48 hours after symptoms have resolved or five days, whichever is longer. So obviously, if someone's still symptomatic at day seven, leave them on. Um, it may be something unrelated to COVID. It could be another respiratory virus, but if they're symptomatic, they should stay on precautions. Um, and so this is the end here. Um, this is, uh, I think, how a lot of us feel uh, during this period. So you just got to transition from the coffee to the wine. Um, and <laughs> uh, I think that's important. Well, uh, and, and I open up to any questions. And again, I, I want to give a, a really um, a heartfelt thank you to all of you guys on, on the front line managing our sickest patients right now with COVID. So welcome any questions that the group has.